Here I am before you, falling in love, seeking your truth, knowing that your perfect grace has brought me to this place. Because of you, I freely live my life to you, oh God, I give. So I stand before you, God. I lift my voice because you set me free. So I Shout out your name From the rooftops I proclaim That I am yours I am yours All that I am I place into your loving hand And I am yours I am yours All the good done for me I lift up my hands you to see you're the only one who brings me to my knees to share this love across the earth the beauty of your holy word so I kneel before you God I lift my hands cause you set me free so I shout out your name From the rooftops I proclaim That I am yours I am yours All that I am I place into your loving hands And I am yours I am yours open to the one, the Son, the everlasting God, the everlasting God. Oh, here I am, I stand, arms wide open to the one, the Son, the everlasting God. Yes, He's the everlasting God. And so I shout out your name from the Stops, I proclaim that I am yours, I am yours, all that I am, I place into your loving hand, and I am yours, I am yours, and so I shout out your name from the rooftop. I proclaim that I am yours, I am yours, all that I am, I place into your loving hands, and I am yours, I am yours, amen. Amen. We're going to worship Jesus today. You may be seated. Good morning. So the psalmist said in Salmo 122, Yo me alegré con los que me decían, a la casa de Jehová iremos. And Psalm 122 says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. So this is where we are this morning. If you speak Spanish, I said it in Spanish for you. This morning we are praying for David and Marcia Neely, and they are from the New England Church Development. Let's pray for them. Praise God that we're here and we get to worship him this morning. Father God, we thank you this morning, Lord. We thank you for the Neely family, Heavenly Father, for the work that they're doing. Lord, we ask for your hand of protection over them. May everything they do, Lord God, be unto you. Protect them, their family, Heavenly Father, and provide their needs. We pray, Lord, for this service today, Lord. As we come into your presence, Holy Spirit, do something like you've never done before this morning. Pour out your spirit, Lord God, on us this morning. Watch over the service, Lord God. 
Watch over this, the, the preachings, the prayers, Heavenly Father. May we, Lord God, honor you this morning in everything we do. We thank you, Heavenly Father, because we still are free to worship you. And we don't take that for granted. We ask, Heavenly Father, that you show us this week, Lord God, how to live and be more like you. So that those that come around us, Heavenly Father, may see you facing us. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray and we thank you this morning. Amen. Now, greet at least three people before you sit down again. Thank you. Good job. Hello, everybody. I tell you something, the weatherman lied today. Because the weatherman said it's a good day to go to the beach. I tell you, it's a, it's a good day to go to church. Amen. You can go to the beach after you go to church if you want. It'll still be nice out. Come on, let's worship the Lord today. Every praise is to our God. Every word of worship in one accord. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Sing hallelujah to our God. Sing glory hallelujah is to our God. Every praise, every praise. Every praise is to our God. Every praise is to our God. Every word of worship is one of God. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Sing hallelujah to our God. Glory hallelujah is to our God. Every praise, every praise, oh, every praise, every praise to our God. 
every praise is to our God. Every word of worship and one of glory. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Sing hallelujah to our God. Glory, hallelujah, is you are God. Every praise, every praise, oh, every praise, every praise is you are God. God, my Savior, God, my healer, God, my deliverer. Yes, He is. Yes, He is. God, my Savior. God, my healer, God, my deliverer. Yes, He is. 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 Every praise, every praise is to our God. Oh, and every word of worship in one accord. Every praise, every praise, oh, every praise, every praise is to our God. Sing hallelujah to our God. Sing glory, hallelujah, is to our God. Every praise, every praise, oh, every praise, every praise is to our God. God, my Savior. God, my Savior. God, my healer. God, my deliverer. Yes, He is. Yes, He is. Yes, He is. Yes, he is. Yes, he God, is. my Savior. God, my Savior. Oh, He's my healer. God, my oh, healer. Oh, He's my deliverer. God, my deliverer. Yes, He is. 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 Every praise. Every praise is to our God. Said every word of worship in one accord. Every praise. Every praise. Oh, every praise. Every praise is to our God. Glory, hallelujah. Sing hallelujah to our God. Sing glory, hallelujah is you our God. Every praise. Every praise. Oh, every praise. Every praise. Every praise. Every praise. Oh, every praise. Every praise. Every praise. Every praise. Every praise. Every praise to our God. If you've been walking the same old road for miles and miles. If you've been hearing the same old voice tell the same old lies. If you're trying to fill the same old holes inside. Oh, there's a better life. Oh, there's a better life. If you've got pain, he's a pain taker. You feel lost, he's a way maker. You need freedom for saving, he's a prison shaking savior. You've got a chain, he's a chain breaker. Well, we've all searched for the light of day in the dead of night. We've all found ourselves worn out from the same old fight. We've all run to things we know just aren't right. Oh, there's a better life. There's a better life. If you've got pain, he's a pain taker. You feel lost. Oh my God is a way maker. If you need freedom or saving, He's a prison shaking Savior. If you've got chain, He's a chain breaker. If you've got pain, He's a pain taker. You feel lost. Oh, he's a way maker. If you need freedom or saving, he's a prison shaking savior. If you've got chains, he's 
a chain breaker. <laughs> to God be the glory, great things he has done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin and opened the life. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory. Great things he had done. Oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood to every believer, the promise of God, the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory. Great things he had done. Great things he has taught us. Great things he has done. Purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our transport when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear His voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father. Jesus the Son and give him the glory great things he had done praise the Lord praise the Lord let the earth hear his voice praise the Lord praise the Lord let the people rejoice oh come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he has done. Amen. Has he done great things in your life? We can tell him about it. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. The earth is going to hear our voices as we shall praise to God for what he has done in our lives. Oh, hallelujah, praises to your name, holy, holy, let every tongue proclaim, Hosanna, joyfully we raise, and live to you our sacrifice of Hallelujah. Lord, we sing our praise to your name. Your holy, holy, let every tongue proclaim. Hosanna. Joyfully we raise and live a sacrifice of praise. Hallelujah. Lord, all praises to your name. Holy, holy, let every tongue proclaim. Oh, 
joyfully we raise and live to you our sacrifice of praise. See one more time. Hallelujah. Lord, praise is to your name. Holy, holy, let every tongue proclaim. Oh,
I pray for your healing. Circumstances would change. I pray that the fear inside would flee in Jesus' name. I pray that a breakthrough would happen today. I pray miracles in your life in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. God, we want to see the miraculous in our lives today. We've all brought things with us that are heavy on our hearts. Loved ones, maybe, Lord, that are, are sick or in trouble. Lord, or sometimes our own family, our, our friends, ourselves, Lord, that we carry these burdens in. But God, today we're going to lay them down to you. Because, Lord, your name is above all other names. Not because of the way it sounds, but because of what it means. That Jesus is our Savior. Father, your Son, Jesus, is our Lord. He's our Redeemer. Purchased our lives by dying for our sins on the cross. And on that cross, Lord, our healings have also been paid for. We come to your throne today, Lord, and ask that you would heal our bodies, heal our minds, and heal our spirits. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Say thank you to Jesus as you're being seated. Amen. Well, good morning. If we have not yet had a chance to meet, my name is Pastor Paulette, and, and I just want to say welcome to the house of the Lord. Um, it is a privilege that I do not take for granted, being able to come here. Um, I just want to know, how many of you are visiting with us today? Our new guests, maybe it's your first time with us, second time with us, if you just want to raise your hand. Our ushers have a, just a welcome packet for you that they would like to put into your hands. Nobody? Nobody new? Yes, as Pastor Dan is saying back here, it's a good reminder to invite somebody to church, right? We want to, oh, okay, I see something. That I, well, anyway, for those of you that are not new people, we welcome you as well. You know, we're, we're honored to have you join us this morning. Um, thank you, gentlemen. If you want to go back and as the ushers come forward, we're going to take up the Lord's offering, the Lord's tithes, our offerings. Ushers, if you want to come forward. And as they are coming, would you just bow your heads and pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for all that we have. We recognize that every good gift comes from you. Everything that we have, everything that we are, is because of your Son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, we say thank you for that. And as we prepare our hearts to give to you this morning, to give back a little bit of what you have blessed us with financially. Father God, we ask that you would have your hand of anointing upon it. Lord, that you would multiply this offering in these tithes, that they would be able to um, help us as a local body of believers, Lord, to, to do the things that you have called us to do here in Methuen, but also, Lord, um, that they would help to increase the kingdom of God globally. So, Lord, we thank you for each gift that is placed into these baskets this morning. Would you bless each household that's here today? God, we thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. As we sing, feel free to come down, bring your offering, or use the online giving card on your pew. Living, he loved me. Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. Oh, rising, he justified. Freed me forever. One day, he's coming back. Glorious day. Oh, one day when heaven was filled with his praises. One day when sin was as black as could be. Oh, Jesus came down to be born of a virgin. Dwelt among men, my example is he. Well, living he loved me, dying he saved me. Buried he carried my sins far away. Rising he justified. 
with me forever. One day it's coming back, glorious day. Well, one day they led him up Calvary's mountain. One day they nailed him to die on that tree. Oh, in suffering anguish, despised and rejected. Bearing our sins, my Redeemer is he. Oh, living he loved me, dying he saved me. Buried he carried my sins far away. Oh, rising he justified, freed me forever. Well, one day he's coming back, glorious day. Well, one day the grave could conceal him no longer. One day the stone rolled away from the door. Oh, then he arose over death he had conquered. Now is ascended, my Lord, evermore. Living he loved me, dying he saved me. Buried he carried my sins far away. Rising he justified, freed me forever. One day he's coming back, glorious day. Well, one day the trumpet gonna sound for his coming. For well, one day the skies with his glory will shine. What a wonderful day my beloved one's bringing. Glorious Savior, this Jesus, he is mine. Well, living he loved me, dying he saved me. Buried he carried my sins far away. Rising he justified, freed me forever. For oh, one day it's coming back, glorious day. Oh, living he loved me, dying he saved me. Buried he carried my sins far away. Oh, rising he justified, freed me forever. One day it's coming back, glorious day. Man, that's the whole gospel right there. You got the birth, the life, the death, the resurrection, and the second coming of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. I could just go on singing. In fact, we're all going to sing one other song, a song that you are learning quite so well. We are learning the books of the New Testament in order so it's easier for us to know that New Testament and look up those verses very quickly. So let's sing our New Testament song. We'll throw the words up for the first time we sing it, and then we'll take them off for the second time. Oh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Acts, and Romans, and Corinthians, Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Thessalonians, Thessalonians, Timothy, Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James, Peter, Peter, John, 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 Jude, and Revelation. All right, well, you sounded wonderful. Let's see how you sound with the words hidden. Oh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Thessalonians, Thessalonians, Timothy, Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James, Peter, Peter, John, 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 Jude, and Revelation. Very good, guys. You're learning so, so well. There's a word for you. I stand. Is there an Old Testament song t- as well? I would like to see that. If you could do that sometime, we would like to see you rap and teach us the Old Testament. Okay. Do you guys want to see that? Okay. Another day. We'll let you practice. Okay, do it right now. 
All right. It goes Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, First and Second Samuel, First and King Kings, First and Second Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalm, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Psalm, Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and then you got Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. There is a special place in heaven for him. That's for sure. That was amazing. Amazing. I have goosebumps, I'm telling you. Holy Spirit bumps, we'll call them. You go. I totally just lost my train of thought. Wow. You're awesome. All right. Back on track. Um, what am I doing? I have some announcements. That's what I'm doing. Uh, just a couple things that I want to bring to your attention today. Um, today, First is this Friday, June 16th, we are going to have our movie night. We're watching Pilgrim's Progress, the cartoon version. So come on out. You don't want to miss this. It's a great movie. If you've ever read this story, um, it is an amazing story. The, the, the movie is great. So come on out. We're going to, um, if you go to your River Report, you can click on the link there and watch the trailer. It'll give you a little bit more information. We're going to have some hot dogs and some popcorn beverages uh, for you. So come on out. It's a great opportunity to invite some friends. Um, Pastor Paul, really, can, can anyone come? Anyone can come. Can whole families can whole come? Whole families can come, yes. Wait, what if I've got some friends or a neighbor who I might want to invite them? Would they, would they be allowed to come? Yes, they can come. They can come, and I will have a hot dog and some popcorn, and we will have... Wait, um, how much money does it cost? It doesn't cost any money. What? No money. No. It's all free. We get the royalties from Pastor Dan's rap are paying for it. <laughs> no, it's all free, but there will be a free will offering taken, um, So, but the event itself is free. Bring your neighbors, bring your friends, bring yourself, um, please... Try and make this a priority for you. It's, it's, it's a great opportunity for us just to get together as the body of Christ. And that's the idea. That's why we're doing some of these events is because we really want to continue to build this awesome community of Riverside Assembly of God. And I have not yet had the chance to meet all of you. So um, please come out if for no other reason so I can get to meet you. Um, and we can have conversation. But again, great opportunity to bring your friends, bring your neighbors. It's a great illustration of the gospel. Okay? So come on out. Opportunity to share Christ with your friends. Um, the other announcement that I have this morning is, and this is um, just so important, we as a church are here for you. We are here to pray for you. We have a prayer team that is, is waiting and always available 24-7. They are praying. Somebody is praying for the needs of our church. You can reach us at prayer at riversideag.com. You can send an email or you can send a text to 978-873-PRAY, which is 7729. Please know and understand you are not alone. Whatever you are going through, whatever you may need, a touch from the Lord, we are here to join you in prayer and to support you. And now we get to Pray for our kids. We were reading in Sunday school this morning. We we're in, Ma in the book of Mark, and we were reading in, in chapter 10, and, and, and Jesus tells the disciples to let the little children come to him. Have you ever noticed the faith that our children have? They, they, they know who Jesus is. They come to Jesus, and they don't say, oh, what do I have to do in order to earn your love, God? What do I need to do to be accepted? They just say, okay, Jesus. I have faith, you said it, and so it is. What a great example for us, right, as we watch our little kids this morning. Look at these two cuties over here. Um, if you are teaching this morning, can I just have you stand up? Because just, I just want to, to recognize who's teaching this morning. Yeah, and we want to say thank you that you are giving up. Yep, that you are, you are missing out on a service in order to teach the next generation because that's what these guys are. So if you'll just bow your heads with me. Uh, let's pray for our children and our teachers. Father God, we thank you again for who you are. Lord, thank you that you love little children. Thank you for the faith that you have instilled in our kids, God, that they just accept and believe because you said so. 
Uh, God, would you continue to speak to their hearts this morning? Would you um, fill them with your Holy Spirit? God, we pray for an infilling, the baptism of the Holy Spirit over our kids today. God, fill them with the power that comes only from you. And Lord, we pray for our teachers. Um, would you equip them with everything that, that they need this morning to lead and to guide our children? And so, God, we thank you for them and ask that you would just continue to have your hand upon each one of our kids. We ask this in Jesus' mighty, precious, and holy name. Amen. Kids, you are dismissed. We'll see you later, kids. Have a great time in Children's Church, and we worship. You're going to have a good time. Today is the, it's the second Sunday of the month, <coughs> excuse me, which means it's Missions Sunday. Uh, we're going to be taking a missions offering uh, in a little bit. We were going to have uh, uh, our own Felix uh, uh, Reyes come and share with us. He's back from his missions trip uh, to the Middle East. Uh, he couldn't come this Sunday. He's going to be here next Sunday. I said next Sunday it would be fine for him to come and share and just give you a quick report of how his missions trip went. Um, but Felix went with a Chi Alpha group. Chi Alpha is our missions organization uh, through the Assemblies of God to minister to college campuses around the country and around the world. We support missionaries through Chi Alpha that uh, are missionaries here in New England, as well as we support Chi Alpha missionaries in Europe and in Japan. Uh, so I thought I would give you a report from just one of our mission, Chi Alpha missionaries. This is uh, uh, Rob and Sarah Malcolm are missionaries to Yale University uh, down in Connecticut. Yale, as you know, Ivy League school, one of the top uh, uh, schools in the nation. And there, right there, we have a thriving Chi Alpha ministry ministering to those college students. Uh, in fact, just uh, recently they had uh, what they call a soiree where they bring uh, everybody together and they honor their seniors who are, of course, they're by their senior year, a lot of them are their, their leaders there in the Chi Alpha ministry, and they, they celebrated them, and they gave them gifts, including, I know that one of their gifts was a, a Christmas ornament, a Chi Alpha, Yale Chi Alpha Christmas ornament, so they will always remember that they are family, uh, even as they uh, have their Christmas trees later uh, for the rest of their lives, they can see that ornament and remind them of the discipleship that they received while they were there in Chi Alpha. Uh, during the last week of class at Yale, um, they have what they call Bulldog Days, uh, in which prospective freshmen come in, uh, and they sit in on classes, and they attend uh, events. So these are like high school seniors that come during that last week just to see what Yale is like. And they had 1,400 uh, potential uh, students come in, uh, and, uh, and just attend classes. Well, Chi Alpha was also part of that soiree. They had their own table set up. They had a, a breakfast uh, for the, the students, and uh, at least 60 students, uh, freshmen that came in, showed some interest in Chi Alpha uh, in the next year, so that's great. Uh, but he uh, uh, wrote, uh, he said that uh, uh, you may want to know what the seniors are going to be doing after they graduate and move on. In these months, we realize how significant and influential a school Yale is. These students will go on to change both our nation and the world. Here's what this group of seniors are off to do. Work with companies such as Microsoft, Amazon, Google, and Deloitte. Do lab research on PTSD and cancer and head off to medical schools across the nation. But we're also excited to announce that four of them, four of these students just graduated Lowell, four of them are coming back to give a year with us here at Lowell. And one of them is heading off to give a year as a missionary in Granada, Spain. So these are college students, they've just got one of the best educations that is offered in the country. And five of them are saying, I'm going to give, before I go off, I'm going to give a year of my life to ministering as a missionary uh, for the Lord. It's through our gifts that we're able to support people like the Malcolms. Through our gifts that the, the Malcolms are able to continue their ministry to Chi Alpha. And those students at Chi Alpha uh, in, in, in Boston, in Connecticut, 
Uh, it, and throughout the world, those students go out and they change the world, especially our New England students, some of the greatest schools in the, in the world. And these students come and they go all over the world and they sh are able to share the gospel wherever they go. Even places where we can't send missionaries, we're able to bring their students to us and share the gospel with them in Chi Alpha. So as we pray for our missions offering, we about ready? As we pray for our missions offering that we're about to receive, uh, let's pray that God will use it to continue to build missionaries here and around the world. Father, I thank you for Rob and Sarah. I, I ask that you continue to bless them in their uh, ministry there at Chi Alpha. I ask, Lord, that as we give today, we would remember what it is we're giving to. It's not just, oh, here's another offering. But God, there are missionaries that are going to be blessed, missionaries that are going to be able to do their job because we're giving today. So, Lord, bless this offering. Use it, God. Let students and men and women and children hear about the gospel of Jesus Christ through our giving. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I believe you gave sight to the blind. I believe that the dead come to life. I believe there were wonders and signs. You're still the same. Believe every word that you say. I believe there are scars in your hands. That your goodness is good without end. You'll never change. I will tell of your wonders, sing of your grace. God of creation knows me by name. The Lord is faithful yesterday, now, and always. Always, your mercy is mighty, age after age. All generations will bow down and praise. The Lord is faithful, yesterday, now, and always. Always, I believe you will come in the clouds. I believe you are here even now. In your presence I know there is power, power to save. I will tell of your wonders, sing of your grace. The God of creation knows me by name. The Lord is faithful yesterday, now, and always, always. Lord, your mercy is mighty, age after age. All generations will bow down and praise. The Lord is faithful yesterday, now, and always. Oh, sing that again. Oh, I will tell of your wonders, sing of your grace. The God of creation knows me by name. The Lord is faithful yesterday, now, and always. Always. Age after age, all generations will bow down and praise. The Lord is faithful yesterday, now, and always. Thank you, worship team. Appreciate your ministry today. Well, I hope everybody's doing well. My wife and I and my son, we were in uh, Virginia at the end of this week. Uh, our own uh, brother Mario and, and sister Mario, uh, and sister Martha Torres, their daughter Melanie got married on Friday uh, to what well, seems like a nice enough guy. Um, but uh, it was a lovely, lovely ceremony. If you're not on the Riverside uh, Facebook page, uh, go ahead and get on there. There are lots of pictures uh, from the wedding uh, that are there. It was a wonderful celebration, uh, and they both uh, apparently have jobs uh, in Washington, D.C., so they'll be, they'll be working uh, there. It's sad to see Melanie go, but as I uh, hugged them both goodbye, I said, come home. And uh, 
And so she promised that she would. So, but it was a wonderful time, and we'll continue to... Hey, how about this? Let's pray right now uh, for Melanie and Dylan, that God would uh, uh, use uh, uh, his mighty hand on them as they begin uh, their marriage. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you uh, for Melanie and Dylan and, I, and this union that, that you've brought about. Lord, you brought them together. Uh, and as they celebrate now and as they go off to Costa Rica for their honeymoon, and I ask that you'd keep them safe, Lord, and, uh, and let them uh, celebrate their new marriage. And as they begin their new marriage, Lord, let it continue to be founded upon the Word of God. Let it continue to be founded upon their relationship to you. Uh, let them, Lord, have, receive all that they desire, all that they need, uh, according to your riches, according to your word, according to your name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Augustine of Hippo was a, a priest from Africa. Uh, he was a theologian. He was a philosopher uh, back in the 4th and 5th centuries. And during his youth and his young adult years, Augustine lived a very worldly life lifestyle, indulging in all sorts of sinful pursuits. But his scholarship was excellent, uh, and he became a very respected man, an academic man, a, a man of letters. And at the age of 30, he took the top academic position in Milan, but he found himself extremely unfulfilled. And in the year 386, at the age of 31, Augustine came under the influence of Ambrose of Milan. Ambrose was an academic as well, and he treated Augustine with kindness and love. And Ambrose's example of Christ's love moved Augustine's heart. Later that year, Augustine converted to Christianity. He didn't understand everything about Christianity, but through the example of Ambrose, he had faith in Jesus. He eventually became a priest, and his writings helped to mold the theology of the Western Church, and his influence is still felt today. And Augustine wrote the following about having faith before you have understanding. This is what he wrote. Understanding is the reward of faith. Therefore, don't seek to understand so that you can believe. Rather, believe so that you can understand. In most circumstances, belief comes before understanding. We have begun this new journey here at Riverside, and we're exploring the call that we have to share the good news. Not everybody's going to understand at first, but some will still choose to believe. How can the example of Jesus instruct us? How can the example of Jesus in the Gospels encourage us in our fulfillment of our call to share? Because we are all called to share the good news. Last time we looked at, at Jesus sharing the good news with a Pharisee named Nicodemus. Today we'll see how Jesus shared the Gospel with someone that society, and especially religious society, said that Jesus should avoid. Let's pray. God, I thank you for your word. It has meant so much to me. It continues to mean so much to me. It continues to teach me. It continues to encourage me. It continues to push me forward, Lord. And let it do the same again today. Push me forward. Help me catch a greater passion for the lost. And to see in the life of your son, Jesus, an example set so that I can do that, fulfill that call better. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen. So you have been called, each of you, as a follower of Jesus, you have been called to share the good news of Jesus Christ. The good news that Jesus has made a way for men and women and even children to be united with God and to receive life that never ends. That through Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, the good news is that our sins, which separated us from God, can now be removed from us, forgiven because Jesus died. That is the good news, the gospel. 
And this is what we're called to share. But sometimes it's hard. We're afraid maybe that, you know, someone might be upset with them if I, if, if I share the, the good news with them. They might get offended if I tell them that they have sins that need to be forgiven. You know what? That's true. It's absolutely possible that they might take offense when we tell them that there are sins that need to be forgiven in their lives. But listen, people need to know about the disease before they're willing to seek after the cure. If they don't know about the disease, they're not looking for a cure. And the disease is sin. But the cure is the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus is our example for sharing the good news. He didn't shy away from confronting people with their sinful state. Jesus was able to reveal the brokenness of a person while still being loving, still being kind. By looking at how Jesus fulfilled his call from the Father to share, then we are better able to fulfill our call to share the gospel. And so as we go through the story, this story from the Bible, look at the ways that Jesus shared the gospel, shared the good news. Last time in John chapter 2, Jesus had upset most of the religious leaders in Jerusalem. He had turned over the tables of, of greedy businesses who were taking advantage of people in the temple. And it was the religious leaders, if you remember, they were the ones who were renting out the temple space to these unscrupulous businessmen. And so the religious leaders who had rented the space were upset with Jesus because that was a source of income for them. And so they got very upset now, Jesus' popularity was growing in Jerusalem. His, his increased popularity among the people in Jerusalem, that made the leaders, the religious leaders in Jerusalem even more angry with Jesus. And that put Jesus and the disciples in danger. So they decided to leave Jerusalem because Jesus knew it was not yet time for him to go to the cross. So they decided to leave Jerusalem and head back to their, their home base in Galilee. But strangely, though, they stopped in Samaria. Now, as you probably know, the Jews and the Samaritans, they didn't get along very well. See, the Samaritans were a people that were descendants of an unholy union between Israelites and Gentiles. So, the Jews considered them half-breeds. And Plus, the Samaritans began to, began to uh, form their own traditions, their own take on religion and how they worship God. So they still worship the God of Abraham, but they rejected the authority of the temple. They rejected the authority of the pure Jews in Jerusalem, if, if you would have it. And they found their own way of worshiping God. So the Jews hated the Samaritans, and the Samaritans hated the Jews right back. Good, God-fearing Jews avoided Samaria as much as possible. You see how uh, on the map there, Samaria is between Jerusalem and the Sea of Galilee? The Jews would go all the way across the Jordan River up on the east just in order to avoid the Samaritan region so they wouldn't have to run into any of those Samaritans. As much as they could, they avoided Samaria and they avoided Samaritans. You know that those religious leaders in Jerusalem would never have gone there. Most Jews never would have gone there. The disciples that Jesus was taking with him would never have gone there were it not for Jesus saying, come on guys, Let's go this way. Good, God-fearing Jews avoided Samaria as much as possible. But Jesus does not let cultural or historical animosity stop him from fulfilling his call to share. Because Jesus loved the people of Samaria just as much as he loved the people in Jerusalem. He loved those Samaritans so much that he was going to go to the cross, not just for the Jews, 
but for those Samaritans as well, the people that the Jews hated. Here were two groups of people who hated each other, and Jesus loved both of them. And he couldn't stand to see the Samaritans without the gospel. So he said, come on, guys, to his disciples. Come on, let's go through this way. And, and I'm sure the disciples said, Samaria? They don't like us very much. We don't like them too much either. But Jesus said, come on, they need to hear as well. So Jesus and the disciples stopped near a Samaritan town around noon. And when the disciples go into town to buy food, Jesus sits and he rests by a well. Now, this is a special well. This well was dug uh, uh, almost 3,000 years before Jesus. It was dug by uh, Jacob, who was the grandson of Abraham. So it's a very special well. And so Jesus, as the disciples go into the town, they're going to go buy some food and maybe they'll cover their faces, but people are going to know they're Jews. Hopefully, they won't run into any trouble in the town. They just want to buy some food. Jesus sits and says, guys, I'm going to relax here in the shade. I'm just going to sit here and you guys come back. Because I think Jesus knew who was coming. So a Samaritan woman comes out to draw water from the well. All alone. And it's the hottest part of the day. Usually women would come to a well uh, throughout Samaria and Judea. Uh, they would come out in early in the day when it's cool. And that way you would have water for all the rest of the day. But this woman comes when it's hot. See, it seems that this woman is not welcomed by the other women in the town. Because she's an outcast. So she's hated by the Jews and she's hated by the Samaritans as well. At least the Samaritan women. We'll see why in a moment. And when she comes to the well, she sees... There's a Jew sitting at the well. She can tell by his dress, because they dress differently. She can tell that there's a Jew sitting there. I'm supposed to stay away from them. And as she approaches the well, he asks her for a drink of water. Turn with me to John chapter 4. We're going to start our story in verse 9. John chapter 4, verse 9. So Jesus asks for a drink of water. Verse 9 says, The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. You're not, you're not even supposed to be talking to me. We... We don't talk to each other. You're supposed to dislike me. How can, how can you ask for a drink? So Jesus, when he, his first words are just a simple request. He asks for, uh, asks for a drink of water. Had Jesus not spoken, that woman probably would have been too afraid to speak. See, his request for a drink not only breaks a, a cultural taboo, it makes her feel needed. Because he says to her, I don't have anything to draw water out with. As you see, I, don't, I, don't I need your help for me to get a drink. He makes her feel needed. He makes her even feel important. And so her question to Jesus opens the door for Jesus to begin to share the good news. What Jesus does is he compares his desire for a, a cup of water to her own spiritual need. John chapter 4, verses 10 through 12. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself? as did also his sons and his livestock. So as Jesus brings up the spiritual, she either seems to be changing the subject or she doesn't seem to understand. And plus she's given 
there's also a kind of not so subtle jab at the Jews as well, because what she's saying is, Jacob is our father. We're children of Abraham too, no matter what you say. Jesus does not get distracted by useless arguments over tiny things that really don't matter in the eternal scheme of things. So Jesus takes the conversation and he brings it back to what's important. And he gives her an illustration that she will understand. Verses 13 and 14. Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. I know you think this well is important, ma'am. I know you, I know you think this, the well of Jacob is important, but I am talking about something better. I'm talking about a water which quenches your thirst forever. A water which, in which the spring will be within you, always quenching your thirst, and will bring about life-giving water, eternal life even. How you like that? See, Jesus is confronting her need. You need, this water is only going to last for so long. What you need is a water that will bring life to you. He's sharing the good news that this is available. And she cannot help but be intrigued. Verse 15, the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. So she wants what Jesus is offering, but there's, it's kind of just a superficial desire so far. She doesn't quite grasp all the spiritual ramifications. She's just thinking, Boy, it'd be great to have running water, you know, within me. I'd never get thirsty again. I won't have to come out here in the middle of the day so as to avoid the other women and and keep coming back and forth. If I'm never thirsty again, that would be awesome. I'd like something like that. She wants something that will make her life easier. (coughs) No more lugging around that heavy water jug. No more avoiding the other women in town. But Jesus makes her face the issue of repentance. Like we said before, he lets her know the disease before she can know she needs the cure. John 4, 16 through 18, he told her, go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. This is why the ladies in, in the Samaritan town don't like her. Home record, they would call her. Jesus' request for her to go get her husband makes her face the reality of her brokenness. When Jesus says, go get your husband, suddenly she has to look within and, re- and, and, and know which she already knows, but she has to face that reality that she is a sinner. He doesn't go into the sordid details, but it's enough for her to understand that she is in sin and Jesus knows about it. But her repentance is not immediate. She doesn't want to face that hard truth of her sin and need for repentance. So she attempts to change the subject again. Verses 19 and 20. Sir, the woman said, I can see you're a prophet. Our answer is worshipped here on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is Jerusalem. So she said, she doesn't want to talk about that whole sin thing. She wasn't trying to talk about her need. So instead she tries to say, change the subject and she talks about worship. She said, now, okay, we say we should worship here. You guys uh, should, wor- you guys say you should worship in Jerusalem. You're obviously a prophet. You're telling me my life. So what do you think about that? Let me change the subject here. But Jesus takes her question and responds in a way that brings the conversation back to her need, back to what she's lacking, that personal relationship with God that she's lacking. Verses 21 through 24. 
Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. Jesus says, all right, you, know, you are talking about this mountain in Jerusalem. Yes, we're, the Jews have got it right. We worship in Jerusalem. But forget about that, he's saying. Forget about this silly question of where you should worship. Because a time is coming when you worship, it doesn't matter where you're going to stand. It matters where you stand in your heart. There's a time that's coming that the Father isn't going to be looking at where your feet are when you worship. He's going to be looking at, are your, is your worship true? Is your worship coming from your, your own spirit, given to the Holy Spirit? Is that the kind of worship you're giving? That's the kind of worship that God is going to be looking for. And so the Samaritan woman, she seems to push back again. This time, she blames a lack of understanding. Verse 25, the woman said, I know the Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Kind of seems like she's closing the conversation. Like, well, someday I'll understand. Someday I'll understand enough to make a choice. You know, when the Messiah comes. Someday... When he comes, you know, thanks for the talk. I'll understand sometime. But today is that day. The Messiah has come. He is explaining things to her so she can understand. Even if she doesn't comprehend everything, the time has come. Salvation is not based on complete understanding. Salvation is based on faith in the Savior, Jesus Christ. Look at what Jesus says in verse 26. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. I'm the one you've been waiting for. I am the Christ. I have explained it to you. It's now up to you whether you're going to accept the truth or reject the truth of what I've shared. Not based on how well you understand it, but based on your faith in me. When the disciples return, the woman runs back to town. Look at verses 28 through 30. Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to town and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Maybe she runs back to town because she's frightened of so many Jewish men suddenly coming into the area, all the disciples joining the privacy of her personal conversation. But she even leaves her, but she leaves her water jar there. That means she's going to come back. There's no doubt in her mind she's going to return. So despite her limited understanding, faith has been awakened in her. And she seeks for confirmation from those who know her best. And so she goes to the people she knows and says, and she proclaims her faith. I've met a prophet. He told me everything about my life. He knows things he shouldn't know. And her faith is a little bit wavering when she says, maybe he's the Messiah. Could this be him? We've waited all this time. Could this be him, the Christ? And their curiosity brings them out to see Jesus as well. Verses 39 through 42. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them. And he stayed two days. Two days in a place he's not supposed to be. Where the Jews don't associate with the Samaritans. And because of his words... Many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves and we know that this man really is 
the Savior of the world. Her personal testimony of how her life had changed brought people to believe in Jesus. A Jew who had broken down the cultural walls and fulfilled his call to share the good news. Even to a people that the religious folk rejected. What lessons can we take today uh, from the example of Jesus? What do we see here in Jesus' sharing that we can apply to our own sharing of the good news? Jesus was called to share himself. Jesus was called to share his Father. And he had a passion for that. He couldn't let the Samaritans go without hearing the good news. He loved them. He pleaded for them. Just as he wept over Jerusalem, Jesus' heart was broken for the Samaritans as well. And we are called to have that same passion because God has that same love for those around us. We are called to share who God is with those who are near. We are called to carry on the ministry of Jesus wherever we are. And the Holy Spirit is given to us to empower us to be witnesses. So what can we take from Jesus' interaction with the Samaritan woman at Jacob's well? What lessons can we apply to our own sharing of the gospel? Well, here's a few that I'm coming away with. The first one is this. Cultural barriers should not hinder the gospel. Cultural barriers should not hinder the gospel. For just about all of human history, people have built walls. Walls to keep people in, walls to keep people out. They built physical walls, they built cultural walls, they built spiritual walls, they built emotional walls, etc., etc. These are walls that separate us from others. These walls of separation can be very hard to penetrate. But there are no walls that are able to withstand the power of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit lives in you. So there are no walls that can stand up to you sharing the good news. Culture said that Jesus shouldn't share with a Samaritan woman. Culture said that a Samaritan woman shouldn't listen to a Jew. But the Holy Spirit broke down those walls to bring the gospel not just to her, but to her entire community. So follow the example of Jesus. When the Holy Spirit directs you to follow our call to share the gospel, no cultural wall should stand in our way. Rich or poor, Republican or Democrat, Haitian or Dominican, black or white, no wall of separation should keep us from sharing the gospel. No wall of separation can stop the Holy Spirit from reaching a human heart. And you are a vessel of the Holy Spirit. Here's a second lesson I'm taking away from the, way, from the way Jesus shared with the Samaritan woman. Let people know they're important. Let people know they're important. When the Samaritan woman approached Jesus, he asked her a question. Can you give me a drink of water? I need your help. I can't get this on my own. You are important to my fulfillment of getting a drink of water. That made her feel good. It made her feel seen. It made her feel needed. It it opened her heart to him. That desire to be seen, that desire to be needed, is in everybody. It's universal. It's something that all of us feel. All of us want to be seen. All of us want to feel needed. And when someone makes us feel important, it opens our hearts to them, doesn't it? So when you share the good news... Help people to feel important. Because you know what? They are important. They're important to God. Jesus sacrificed himself on the cross for them. That's how important they are to him. So when you show people that they are needed and loved, their hearts will open to the message of the gospel. Here's a third thing that I'm taking away from Jesus' sharing with the Samaritan woman. Don't get distracted by small things. Don't get distracted by small things. Twice it seems that the Samaritan woman tried to get Jesus off the topic of the gospel. Twice she kind of tried to sidetrack him, distract Jesus from bringing up the... the, And she tried to distract him by bringing up 
small things, like the legitimacy of the Samaritan birthright. She tried to distract Jesus by bringing up the correct way to worship. But Jesus was focused on his call to share the good news. He wouldn't be distracted by smaller things. He wouldn't be diverted from his purpose in sharing God's truth. Let me tell you that the devil does not want you to fulfill your call to share. He would be perfectly happy for you to never share with anybody. And so the devil will bring all sorts of distractions to those very important conversations. Well, what about politics? What about all the bad things the church has done? What about tolerance? What about relative truth? Don't get into discussions or arguments about small things. Keep your focus on your call to share who God is and what he has done. The call to share the love of God and the good news that he wants to forgive them and redeem them. That they can be in a real relationship with God, unfettered by sin. And that brings us to the next lesson I'm taking away. Help people understand their need. Help people understand their need. Jesus showed that woman her sin. It wasn't that she didn't know it was sin. Even the Samaritans knew what she was doing was sinful. He wasn't bringing it up, but listen, he wasn't bringing it up to condemn her. He wasn't saying, hereby, because of thou sin, I shall condemn thee. Now I shall smite thee with my might. That's not what Jesus did. He wasn't bringing their sin up to condemn her. He was bringing up her sin so she could see her need for forgiveness. And that the source of forgiveness is available to her. We've said it before, you need to know the disease so that you will desire the cure. And for us, that disease is sin. We're all infected with it. We all need to be healed. So let people see the reality of the brokenness of sin so that they will desire the healing of the cross. We, as followers of Christ, we have received this healing, not because of anything we've done, but because of what Jesus did. Jesus became the sacrifice for us. He took the punishment for our sins upon him so that we didn't have to face that punishment. So when we bring up the reality of the sinfulness of someone's life, it's not so we can condemn them and say, I'm so much better than you. It's not so that we can condemn them and say, God's going to get you for that. It's so that we can say, I've been there too. I suffered from that sickness. But Jesus forgave me and he healed me and he washed me. Let people see the reality of their brokenness so they will desire the healing of the cross. Because if they don't see the sin, they won't see the need for forgiveness. I say, I don't think I have anything to repent for. They won't desire that personal relationship with God. Here's another lesson that I'm taking away. Salvation is based on faith, not on complete understanding. The Samaritan woman doesn't understand everything at the end of her talk with Jesus. She doesn't know about the cross. She doesn't understand the true reason God sent his son. All she knows is Jesus. And she believes in him. And she knows she has to repent and follow him. And that's all that's necessary for salvation. That's it. To believe in Jesus and to repent and follow him. So don't expect people to understand everything about how salvation works the mechanics of how salvation works. I'm not sure I understand completely everything about how salvation works, but I do know that it has been accomplished in my life. I'm still working it out, but God doesn't need my understanding to save me. All he needs is my faith in him, believing in him, giving him my life over to him, my repentance, so I can become a follower of Jesus. That's all he needs. He doesn't need my understanding. There's an an old hymn that said, I know not how the Spirit moves convicting men of sin, but I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed to him 
against that day. So don't think you have to explain everything. Don't think you have to pretend you know everything. A lot of times, faith is believing without understanding. If you understood it all, it wouldn't really be faith. Faith is believing without all the understanding. And when they have come to that point of belief, and when they've come to a willingness to repent, lead them to the foot of the cross. Lead them to the place of God's glory. And make the introduction. This is Jesus, and he's ready to receive you. And I tell you today, if you've never made that decision, you've never made that choice to say, Jesus, I believe in you. I know that the sinfulness is there. So I repent. I acknowledge my sinfulness. And instead of following my sin, I'm going to follow you. Help me to do that. Pick me up when I fall. Fill your spirit within me. And let me become your child. If you've never made that decision, Today can be the day, just like for the Samaritan woman. She said, well, eventually I'll understand. You don't have to understand everything. Today can be the day, because today Jesus has come to you. If you want to give your heart to Christ today, this is a good day to do it. You'll remember June 11, 2023, when you gave your heart to Jesus. I'd like everybody to bow your head and close your eyes for just a moment. We're praying. And I'm going to ask the, uh, as, a, as we pray, I'm going to ask the prayer team members to come on up. You'll recognize the prayer team members. They'll be standing alongside me, and uh, they'll have red uh, lanyards on. You'll, they, they're here to pray with you. But if you want to give your life to Jesus, I want to ask, would you, would you just raise your hand right now so that we know who to pray for? Is there anybody here that says, yeah, Pastor Dan, I want to give my life to Jesus today. You can just slip up your hand real quick. Let me see it, though. Look, look me. Look at me when you do so that I can, we can kind of see each other's eyes and I can acknowledge that I see your hand. Anybody? Listen, maybe you're embarrassed to raise your hand. Maybe you don't want me to see. But Jesus was not embarrassed to show his love for you. He was bold enough to go to the cross. And if you need healing, if you need salvation, if you need a baptism in the Holy Spirit, he's willing to meet your need today. Father, show us our need today. Show us that we need more of you. If, we have, if, if there are those that are here that have yet to accept you, God, show them. Pull them by your Holy Spirit. Don't let them be comfortable until they have made that decision to follow after you because it's the most important decision they'll ever make. Father, if there are those that have needs in their heart, whether they need a spiritual touch, they need the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they need, they need a physical touch, Lord, they need a healing in their body, whatever it is, God, help us to be willing to come because today is the day that we can meet with you. And just like the Samaritan woman had that wonderful conversation, Lord, we can have that wonderful conversation with you too. I ask this in Jesus' name, amen. So prayer team, please come uh, at this time. The worship team is going to come. They're going to play some uh, uh, worship music. But I ask you not to rush off. There's plenty of time still. You can still get to the beach if you want. But uh, l- be willing to spend a little time with Jesus. Be willing to spend a little time in conversation to see what is my need and how can, I, how can my need be met by Jesus. When you have to go, we understand. You've got to go. We we loved having you. Hope to uh, see you again soon. Come out Friday night for our movie. It's going to be great. It's going to be a lot of fun. The kids will like it too. Uh, It's a great family time. But be willing to pray. These prayer team members and myself, we're ready to pray with you. But may God bless you the rest of this week and hope to see you on Friday. Love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. 
All my days I've been held.